Welcome to Reclaiming the Faith with Bill Baker, a podcast with a mission to reveal what the earliest Christians believed about the core issues facing us today. You can find links to all of Phil's resources at philsbaker.com. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen today and take a moment to share this podcast with your friends. Now, here's Phil. Hey, y'all, this is episode 132, and today I'm going to be looking at the issue of original sin. What did people like Augustine and John Calvin believe? What did the earliest Christians believe? What does the Bible say, and what implication does that have for our lives? Just a quick announcement. I have a lyric video for the first song off my upcoming album, Dusk and Dawn. That's available on YouTube for you to check out. It is called At Your Feet. It features Hannah Red and Aaron Moffitt did the video production. So please go check that out. There'll be a link for it in the show notes. Also, if you're blessed by this episode, please consider leaving a positive rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you're listening to this show. Also, I'm blessed to be a part of Omega Frequency along with BDK, and you can find all of our content on our YouTube channel, Omega Frequency Live, so go check that out and become a subscriber. All right, well, without any further ado, let's get into episode 132, Original Sin. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. This is one of the key verses that is used in explaining the doctrine of original sin. And as we begin to unpack this teaching, we're going to look at it through three lenses. First, How did Augustine and John Calvin understand this doctrine? Second, how did the early Christians understand it? And third, what does the Bible say? And of course, John Calvin, Augustine, and the early Christians are leaning on the Bible. We'll just look at a few more passages. Now, as we do this, I want you to keep in mind a quote from Tim Keller, which is just profound. He writes, You are more sinful than you ever thought you were, and you are more loved than you ever dreamed you could be. So as we do this, I want you to think which of these approaches shows humanity as most sinful, and thus which approach shows humanity as most loved. So let's start with Augustine. Around the year 412, As many of his doctrines began to change, he wrote a work called On Merit and the Forgiveness of Sins and the Baptism of Infants. And this is in book one, starting in verse, sorry, chapter nine. The name of this chapter is Sin Passes on to All Men by Natural Descent and Not Merely by Imitation. So he writes, You tell me in your letter that they endeavor to twist into some new sense the passage of the apostle in which he says, and this is Romans 5.12, by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. Yet you have not informed me what they suppose to be the meaning of these words. But so far as I have discovered from others, they think that the death which is here mentioned is not the death of the body, which they will not allow Adam to have deserved by his sin, but that of the soul, which takes place in actual sin, and that this actual sin has not been transmitted from the first man to other persons by natural descent, but by imitation. Hence, Likewise, they refuse to believe that in infants, original sin is remitted through baptism, for they contend that no such original sin exists at all in people by their birth. But if the apostle had wished to assert that sin entered into the world, not by natural descent, but by imitation, he would have mentioned as the first offender, not Adam indeed, but the devil." 
And then moving to chapter 21 of the same work, the title of this chapter, Unbaptized Infants Are Damned, But Most Lightly, The Penalty of Adam's Sin, The Grace of His Body Lost. Augustine writes, It may therefore be correctly affirmed that such infants as quit the body without being baptized will be involved in the mildest condemnation of all. That person, therefore, greatly deceives both himself and others who teaches that they will not be involved in condemnation. So, in this work, Augustine actually argues against the early Christian position, which we'll get to later, but he also puts forward a position that is not generally held by Protestants, which is that baptism of infants saves infants. It's baptism that remits sin. And in that respect, Augustine actually is, in one sense, holding the early Christian position. They did believe that at baptism, remissions of sin, remission of sins occurred. Now, they did not believe, the earliest Christians did not believe in infant baptism. They believed in baptism because of repentance. Uh, And of course, an infant can't repent of something they don't understand. So you have kind of a, you have a hybrid of the early Christian position with Augustine in one sense, uh, though the earliest Christians, as you'll see, were very much against people being condemned just by nature of being born of Adam. They believe people who sin are condemned. So let's get into John Calvin, all right? This is, uh, Calvin, of course, is a disciple, you could say, of Augustine, um, a very, very strong disciple of Augustine, even though he's writing, you know, around a thousand years or so later uh, than Augustine. So here is Calvin writing specifically about original sin, using that same verbiage, just like Augustine in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, Book 2, Chapter 1, Section 8. He writes, quote, Original sin, then, may be defined as a hereditary corruption and depravity of our nature, extending to all the parts of the soul, which first makes us obnoxious to the wrath of God, and then produces in us works which are in Scripture termed works of the flesh. The two things, therefore, are to be distinctly observed, namely, that being thus perverted and corrupted in all the parts of our nature, we are, merely on account of such corruption, deservedly condemned by God, to whom nothing is acceptable but righteousness, innocence, and purity. And the apostle most distinctly testifies that death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Again, that's from Romans 12, 5, 12. That is, are, all are involved in original sin and polluted by its stain. Hence, even infants bringing their condemnation with them from their mother's womb suffer not for another's, but for their own defect. For although they have not yet produced the fruits of their own unrighteousness, They have the seed implanted in them. Nay, their whole nature is, as it were, a seed bed of sin, and therefore cannot but be odious and abominable to God. Hence, it follows that it is properly deemed sinful in the sight of God, for there could be no condemnation without guilt. Next comes the other point, Namely, that this perversity in us never ceases, but constantly produces new fruits. In other words, those works of the flesh which we formerly described. For our nature is not only utterly devoid of goodness, but so prolific in all kinds of evil that it can never be idle." So just to kind of sum that up, we are not condemned, according to Calvin, we are not condemned before God for the fault of Adam, but rather on account of 
our corrupted nature that has resulted from his trespass. So Calvin asserts that it is our state of total depravity due to original sin and the sins that come forth from that state, which make us liable to the condemnation of God. And we are doing that from the womb, though the fruits of that sin nature haven't been uh, observed yet. Let's continue with Calvin as we're thinking about Adam's fall and the effect that that had on humanity and how that fall took place. Who is responsible for that fall that Romans 5.12 describes? He writes in his Institutes, Book 3, Chapter 23, Paragraph 7, quote, Again, I ask, whence does it happen that Adam's fall irremediably involved so many peoples together with their infant offspring in eternal death, unless because it so pleased God? The decree is dreadful indeed, I confess, yet no one can deny that God foreknew what end man was to have before he created him, and consequently foreknew because he so ordained by his decree. And it ought not to seem absurd for me to say that God not only foresaw the fall of the first man and in him the ruin of his descendants, but also meted it out in accordance with his own decision. He writes in the same book, the same chapter, one paragraph earlier, quote, but since he foresees the future events only by reason of the fact that he decreed that they take place, they vainly raise a quarrel over foreknowledge when it is clear that all things take place rather by God's determination and bidding. So it's interesting that John Calvin puts all of the blame on Adam for uh, the sin in the garden, and he's putting the blame on all of us, even from the womb, being sinful and odious and obnoxious to God. But in the same institutes of the Christian religion, just a different book, he actually says that the reason that Adam fell was because God ordained for him to fall. God only foreknew that Adam would reject him because God decreed that Adam would reject him. So who is actually responsible in the Reformed view? Who is actually responsible for the fall of Adam and Eve? Let's get into the early Christians, all right? So let's read about the fall of Adam and Eve from Justin Martyr. So this is around 160 AD. Justin writes, quote, the human race from Adam had fallen under the power of death and the guile of the serpent. Each one had committed personal transgression. Moving forward, the whole human race will be found to be under a curse, for it is written in the law of Moses, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all the things that are written in the book of the law to do them. And no one has accurately done them all. God ordained that if man kept this, he would partake of immortal existence. However, if he transgressed it, his lot would be just the opposite. Having been made in this manner, man soon went towards transgression, and so he naturally became subject to corruption. Therefore, corruption became inherent in nature. So just a couple of differences here that uh, Justin describes. For one, he says God did not foreordain that man would fall. He says God ordained that if he fell, he would become mortal. And Justin also writes that because Adam fell, we 
we became corrupt in our nature. Now, he's not going to the point of total depravity in the way that Augustine or Calvin would attempt to articulate. Um, he says we became corrupt. All right. Here's Irenaeus. He is a disciple of Polycarp, who was the disciple of the Apostle John. Irenaeus writes, quote, and this is a short one, By means of our first parents, we were all brought into bondage by being made subject to death. So, Irenaeus is saying pretty simply, because Adam and Eve sinned, because of original sin, we are all made subject to death. Here's Tertullian writing a little bit after the year 200, around 207, in a work called A Treatise on the Soul. This is a little bit longer, but here he too deals with the issue of original sin and actually uses that phrase. So this is chapter 41 from A Treatise on the Soul. Tertullian writes, quote, Notwithstanding the depravity of man's soul by original sin, there is yet left a basis whereon divine grace can work for its recovery by spiritual regeneration. As we have said before, the corruption of our nature is another nature having a God and Father of its own, namely the author of that corruption. Still, there is a portion of good in the soul of that original divine and genuine good, which is its proper nature. For that which is derived from God is rather obscured than extinguished. It can be obscured indeed because it is not God. Extinguished, however, it cannot be because it comes from God. As therefore light, when intercepted by an opaque body, still remains, although it is not apparent, by reason of the interposition of so dense a body. So likewise, the good in the soul being weighed down by the evil is, owing to the obscuring character thereof, either not seen at all, its light being wholly hidden, or else only a stray beam is there visible when it struggles through by an accidental outlet. Thus, some men are very bad, and some very good. Even in the worst, there is something good, and in the best, there is something bad, for God alone is without sin. And the only man without sin is Christ, since Christ is also God. Just as no soul is without sin, so neither is any soul without the seeds of good. Therefore, when the soul embraces the faith, being renewed in its second birth by water and the power from above, then the veil of its former corruption being taken away— it beholds the light in all its brightness. It is also taken up in its second birth by the Holy Spirit, just as in its first birth it is embraced by the unholy spirit. The flesh follows the soul now wedded to the spirit as part of the bridal portion, no longer the servant of the soul, but of the spirit. So for Tertullian, Original sin does not mean that we cannot do good. It also does not mean that we are not totally evil. It does mean, though, that even though we are capable of good, we are not capable of saving ourselves. We must be born again by God. Let's go to Commodianus around the year 240. He writes, quote, Adam was the first man who fell, and he conferred on us also what he did, whether good or of evil. For he was the chief of all who were born from him. As a result, we die through this means. For he, receding from the divine, 
became an outcast from the word. All right, so we've looked at what Augustine and Calvin had to say about original sin. We looked at what the early Christians had to say about that. Now let's look at the scriptures and we'll do a little bit of pushback on some of what the early Christians said. So some of you may have been thinking, hold on, doesn't Romans chapter 3 verse 9 say that there is no one righteous, no not one? And of course, Paul was quoting from Psalm 14, which was written by David. And uh, we'll come back to that in just a second. But before that, let's read Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 18, give a little bit of uh, context to it. So Paul writes, both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. It's pretty harsh. Uh, So Paul here is quoting David, like we said, from Psalm 14. So let's look at something else that David said about himself. Now we're going to look at 2 Samuel chapter 22, and we're going to start in verse 22, but uh, just so you know, David uh, is writing this after having fought and defeated giants at Gath. And he writes again, the second Samuel 22, starting in verse 22 through 25, quote, for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not acted wickedly against my God for all his ordinances were before me. And as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also blameless toward him and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my clean- cleanness before his eyes. Unquote. And the Bible also talks about other people being righteous. It talks about Noah, Job, Daniel, Joseph, John the Baptist, Zechariah, his wife Elizabeth. Simeon, Joseph of Arimathea, just to name a few. All these people are called righteous in the scriptures. But then we also have texts like Isaiah 64, verses 6 through 7, where Isaiah writes, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name, who arouses, who arouses himself to hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the power of our iniquities. There's no one who calls on his name? Well, if you look at the previous chapter, you see more of what Isaiah is saying. And he's actually talking to God. Isaiah writes in Isaiah 63, 15, look down from heaven and see from your holy and glorious habitation. Where are your zeal and your mighty deeds? The stirrings of your heart and your compassion are restrained toward me, for you are our father. Though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not recognize us, You, O Lord, are our Father. Our Redeemer from old is your name. Why, O Lord, do you cause us to stray from your ways and harden our heart from fearing you? 
Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes of your heritage. Your holy people possessed your sanctuary for a little while, and our adversaries have trodden it down. We have become like those over whom you have never ruled, like those who were not called by your name. It um, sounds like Isaiah is calling on God's name. And then he writes, no one calls on... Maybe Isaiah is being a little bit hyperbolic. In fact, in Genesis, we see people after the fall calling on the name of the Lord. Here's Genesis chapter 5, starting in verse 25. Adam had relations with his wife again. This is after Cain murdered Abel. And she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth, to him also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Notice that's Adam's grandson calling on the name of the Lord. Paul said, there's no one who seeks God. Well, what about in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verse 1? Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. He did right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David and did not turn aside to the right or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still a youth, he began to seek the God of his father, David. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the Asherim, the carved images, and the molten images. They tore down the altars of the Baals in his presence, and the incense altars that were high above them he chopped down. Also the Asherim, the carved images, the molten images he broke in pieces and ground to powder and scattered it on the graves of those who sacrificed to them. Then he burned the bones of the priests on the altars and purged Judah and Jerusalem. In the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, Simeon, even as far as Naphtali, and in their surrounding ruins, he also tore down the altars and beat the Asherim and the carved images into powder and chopped down all the incense altars throughout the land of Israel. Then he returned to Jerusalem. So I, that's just one example of many I could have turned to. But so what do we do with Psalm 14, with Isaiah 64 and Romans 3 concerning righteousness? Well, Ezekiel 18 has a lot to say, and Ezekiel 33 as well. We're going to read a lot of Ezekiel 18 now and talk about it a little bit as we go. So this is Ezekiel 18, starting in verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, What do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers eat the sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge? As I live declares the Lord God, you are surely not going to use this proverb in Israel anymore. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins will die. So there was this proverb going on as we pause for a second in Israel. Basically, the people living at the time of Ezekiel are saying we are being uh, disciplined we are being judged by God, not because of what we did, but because of what our parents did. Kind of sounds like the Reformed view of original sin, uh, in one sense, uh, at least from Augustine's viewpoint. Uh, you know, infants are, are born condemned because of what was passed on to us from Adam. Anyway, remember what Ezekiel just said uh, the soul who sins will die. Continuing in verse 5, But if a man is righteous and practices justice and righteousness, 
and does not eat at the mountain shrines or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel or defile his neighbor's wife or approach a woman during her menstrual period. If a man does not oppress anyone but restores to the debtor his pledge, does not commit a commit robbery, but gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with clothing. And if he does not lend money or interest or take increase, if he keeps his hand from iniquity and executes true justice between man and man, if he walks in my statutes and my ordinances so as to deal faithfully, he is righteous and will surely live, declares the Lord God. So this is basically what it means when it's calling people righteous in the Bible. They are people who are characterized by doing that which God approves of and avoiding that which God does not approve of. Let's continue, though. Ezekiel writes, Then he may have a violent son, this righteous person may have a violent son who sheds blood and who does any of these things to a brother, though the man himself did not do any things, any of these things. That is, he even eats at the mountain shrines and defiles his neighbor's wife, oppresses the poor and needy, commits robbery, does not restore a pledge, but lifts up his eyes to the idols and commits abomination. He lends money on interest and takes increase. Will he live? He will not live. He has committed all these abominations. He will surely be put to death. His blood will be on his own head. All right, so the first man, he did righteous acts before God. He was a righteous man before God. He gave birth to a son, though, who did the opposite, who acted very wickedly. All right, and if you think about some of the kings... This kind of a thing happened. A good king may give birth to a really bad king who may give birth to a really good king. All right? So the second one was very bad, but his blood is on his own head. So we did the father, the son, and now we get to the grandson. All right? Verse 14. Now behold, he has a son who has observed all his father's sins which he committed and observing does not do likewise. So the grandkid was looking at his dad doing all this evil, but he's like, I'm not doing that. Verse 15, he does not eat at the mountain shrines or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel or defile his neighbor's wife or oppress anyone or retain a pledge or commit robbery, but he gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with clothing. He keeps his hand from the poor, does not... Uh, take interest or increase, but executes my ordinances and walks in my statutes. So the grandson's not following in the ways of his dad. He's following in the ways of his granddad, basically. Well, he will not die for his father's iniquity. He will surely live. As for his father, because he practiced extortion, robbed his brother, and did what was not good among his people, behold, he will die for his iniquity. Yet you say, why should the son not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity? When the son has practiced justice and righteousness and has observed all my statutes and done them, he shall surely live. Again, Ezekiel writes, the person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. But if the wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed and observes all my statutes and practices justice and righteousness, he shall surely live, he shall not die. And his transgressions which he has committed will not be remembered against him because of his righteousness which he has practiced. He will live. Repentance, right? Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord? No, rather that he should turn from his ways and live. That uh, sounds a lot like the king Manasseh, right? Very wicked, but repented of that genuinely. But there's more. 
Verse 24, when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity, and does according to all the abominations that a wicked man does, will he live? No. All his righteous deeds which he has done will not be remembered, for his treachery which he has committed and his sin which he has committed, for them he will die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not right. Well, hear now, O house of Israel, is my way not right? Is it not your ways that are not right? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and dies because of it, for his iniquity which he has committed, he will die. But again, when a wicked man turns away from his wickedness which he has committed and practices justice and righteousness, he will save his life because he considered and turned away from all his transgressions which he has committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Ezekiel picks up on this same thing in verse 30, or sorry, in chapter 33. And we'll look at this in verse 12, just a little bit of a nuance of, of a difference, okay? Ezekiel writes, And you, son of man, say to your fellow citizens, the righteousness of a righteous man will not deliver him in the day of his transgression. And as for the wickedness of the wicked, he will not stumble because of it in the day when he turns from his wickedness. Whereas a righteous man will not be able to live by his righteousness on the day when he commits sin. Unquote. So, what you can see from all of this is though we can be declared righteous by doing right in God's eyes, we need a righteousness beyond our own to stand before God. Our own righteousness won't deliver us when there is sin. So, Let's get into a little bit more of Romans. Let's look at Romans chapter 4, starting in verse 16. Paul writes, For this reason it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, a father of many nations I have made you, both Jew and Gentile, those who by faith believe in the promised Messiah, Jesus. In the presence of him whom he has believed, even God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist, in hope against hope he believed, so that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but also for our sakes to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. So in one sense, Abraham was dead, right? He had no ability to save himself, but he did have the power to act on faith Though acting on faith alone would not produce the child of the promise, Isaac, God had to do that miracle, but Abraham had to believe and act on that faith, even though he knew that he could not do it on, him, on his own. 
and thus he was considered righteous in the sight of God by believing in God's promise and God's ability to bring about what Abraham could not. Romans chapter 5, verse 6, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Notice that he's calling us ungodly, but he's also saying that there are righteous people, there are good people that someone might die for, but God died for us sinners. Hmm. Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. And I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. It seems like Paul is saying here that when we imitate our spiritual forefather Adam, we become in bondage to sin. The soul that sins die. But he's not saying that we were born dead. We were born alive with the potential for both good and evil. But when we choose evil, we die. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul writes, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So, is Paul saying that we were born dead, born sinners from our mother's womb? Or was he saying that we were dead in our sins and trespasses when we walked in them, when we chose to follow the prince of the power of the air, Satan. So as we're starting to bring this to a close, I would like to, to say that we are very much like Adam, image bearers of God Almighty who are capable of both good and bad because of our free will, born alive, but when we sin, we become in bondage to that sin. We are very much like Abraham, capable of doing both good and bad, but helpless, helpless apart from the miraculous intervention of God. We are incapable of saving ourselves. It is faith in the messianic promise of God that makes us righteous in his sight. So, yeah, I want to close this by looking at one final story. This is the story of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Cornelius is, as you will see, is called a righteous man. He does good, but he will die in his sin if he does not believe in Jesus. Jesus has lived and died and resurrected, and Cornelius, being a Jew, lives very close to Jerusalem, 
he's surely heard of Jesus, but he's not believing in Jesus. He does not believe that Jesus is the messianic hope promised to Abraham. He does not believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world. He needs help. Acts chapter 10, verse 1. Now, there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. Sounds a lot like the um, Ezekiel 18 passage. Verse 3, about the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Pause there. It's pretty powerful. You have a man who does not believe in Jesus, and yet his prayers and alms have come up before God as basically like a sweet aroma. God is very much aware of what's going on with Cornelius. He is pleased with what Cornelius is doing, but there is a big problem. Cornelius needs to believe in Jesus. So, God gives a vision to Peter, who is staying pretty close to Caesarea. Peter's in Joppa. And so, God gives Peter a vision, and you can read about more in, in Acts 10 in this passage, and tells him that there are two, there are some servants sent from Cornelius that are uh, going to tell him where he needs to go. All right? So, verse 21, Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I'm the one you're looking for. What's the reason for which you have come? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. He's a pretty good guy, but his righteousness won't deliver him. Skipping to verse 30, Cornelius said four days ago, as he's interacting with Peter, four days ago to this hour, I was praying in my house during the ninth hour and behold, a man stood before me in shining garments. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Therefore, send to Joppa and invite Simon, who is also called Peter, to come to you. He is staying at the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here present before God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. And skipping ahead a little bit, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth. How God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went along doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us 
to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. And while Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. Peter so well um, embodies what Paul writes at the beginning of Romans 1 in verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it, The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. So let's come back to that Tim Keller quote. You are more sinful than you ever thought you were. And you are more loved than you ever dreamed you could be. Which position shows that truth more clearly? The position that says that you're incapable of doing anything good and God foreordained you to do all of these terrible things. He doesn't just know it. He knows it because he determined for you to do all these things. Or the position that says you are capable of actually doing a lot of good. You are not totally depraved. You are capable of doing good, and yet you choose to do evil. You have the responsibility to do good because you are able to respond, and yet you choose not to. I think the person who's able to respond yet rejects is probably more guilty, more responsible than a person who could not do good. But remember the words of Jesus. He who has been forgiven much will love much. 